Alan Garfinkel with us. Alan is a professor in the Department of Medicine and Physiology, I think. Physiological Sciences. Mm -hmm. In uh, UCLA. And uh, he's done some really elegant work on the dynamics of cardiac arrhythmias at the level of the whole heart. And uh, you'll hear about bifurcations and alterants and things of that, things of that nature. Uh, most of it is uh, using mathematical modeling, but the, the his modeling work is really uh, dependent strongly on experimental data. Alan uh, received his uh, undergraduate degree from Cornell in mathematics and bio and uh, philosophy, <laughs> and then continued um, at uh, Harvard. Uh, this time it was not mathematics and philosophy, it was philosophy and mathematics. But, uh, you know, the mixture has changed, but basically the same. And from there he moved to the West Coast and uh, stayed at UCLA. Um, we have a really a well-known group that conducts uh, research that has involved since the beginning. So it's considered the, the, the first to uh, use both models and experiments and try to integrate across scales of the uh, cardiac system. So it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm going to try a gamble. Hey, could you guys come in? Can you sit over here? Oh, I'm going to be speaking to these people. Can you sit over there? Um, and the other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to try an experiment. I'm going to turn off the lights. Because I've got a lot of color stills. And if I can't keep you awake, that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> ah, we just had a double negative. No, turn that off. So we have to turn off this. There we go. Right. The yeah. color pops out a lot better. Well, thanks. It is great to be here. And thank you very much to Yoram. Thank you very much to Gwen organizing all of this. So I want to talk about bifurcation, something called bifurcation theory and cardiac arrhythmias. And the first thing I have to do is tell you what bifurcation theory is, because I'm assuming that nobody here knows. So the history is actually quite interesting. The history begins with Isaac Newton and the two-body problem. So Newton, I think I should introduce that to answer the picture. So Newton hypothesized that the motion of the Earth is governed by a force and then wrote out differential equations. He actually had to define the derivative. He actually had to define differential equations. He had to define the derivative. He had to invent calculus in order to define concept of a differential equation. And prime here, of course, always means dx dt. Uh, so he was able to write out eight equations that represented the two-body problem. And then the amazing thing was he was able, in 300 pages, to bang on these equations with essentially symbolic manipulations and rules and substituting this for this and creating this and that. And he was able to solve these differential equations. And by solve here, I mean he was able to exhibit a function phi of these state variables whose derivatives were exactly those given by the differential equation, provided an analytic solution to the two-body problem. And of course, that 5T, that analytic solution, was that the planet moves in, in an ellipse. So he was able to explain the elliptical motion of the planets by appeal to these differential equations. 
And that is a super powerful paradigm that dominated science for 200 years. Unfortunately, it represented a dead end in science. And nobody was prepared to grasp that. The whole idea of what is science you write a differential equation, and then you bang on that differential equation, and you produce the solution. And that is what science is. Unfortunately, this is the one and only example for which it could be. <coughs> and Newton himself realized that the two-body problem is not a good model for the solar system. And he was very concerned to prove the stability of the solar orbits in the solar system because if they weren't unstable, if they weren't stable, then God made a mistake. <laughs> and we want to be able to say that God did not make a mistake, that these are stable, closed orbits. So he formulates the three-body problem. The three-body problem is no different from the two. Instead of the eight variables, you have 12. You have Jupiter which is the planet he was thinking about, Jupiter actually contributes like 1% to the, to the gravitational pull. Um, and so he has Jupiter equations. You have to add the force of Jupiter to the force on all of these. And it's now a 12 variable differential equation. So if you could solve an eight variable, he figures he can solve a 12 variable. How different could it be? Well, it turns out it's very, very different. Finish. Not only did he die not having solved this, but so did Laplace, Lagrange, Fourier, every great mathematician of the 17th and 18th centuries tried to solve the three-body problem, and they all failed. The genius who, in 1889, proves mathematically that the three-body problem has no analytical solution. For you math fans, it means that the power series diverges. So we're in big trouble here. There is no analytic solution, but Poincaré was a genius. And he took a step backward, and he said, is that what we really want? Do you really need the equation of motion because if you do, you're not going to get it. So he takes a step back and he redefines the purpose of mathematical model. And he redefines the purpose of science. It's no longer show me the exact function that describes the orbit. He now wants to talk about qualitative types. And if you want to know why the three-body problem has no analytic solution, here is an example of a numerically computed orbit in solution to the three-body problem. And you see the trajectory of that small particle, and I ask you, what is the function that describes that motion? And that's a sort of a poor folks proof of the fact that there is no analytic solution to this problem. Incidentally, that trajectory is chaotic. And the motions of the planets in the solar system are not the closed ellipses that they taught you in high school. In fact, many papers in science and nature, uh, from MIT and NASA, all have established that the orbits of the planets are actually slightly chaotic. And that Poincaré was right. So as I said, oh, and by the way, you cannot say numerically computed orbit without a bow in the direction of Katherine Johnson. I don't know if you saw the movie Hidden Figures, but if you didn't, go see it, because it's really, really good. And it tells a story about how a group of African-American women working for NASA computed the orbit that took the Apollo mission to the moon and they computed it by hand using Euler's method and others in a room full of people actually numerically approximating the orbit. 
But Poincaré said there are two ways to deal with this nonlinearity, two ways to deal with this unsolvability. Numerical computation, very important. But there's another method. There's another method, which he called qualitative dynamics. And in qualitative dynamics, you have a different objective. You're no longer trying to describe the exact trajectory. You're trying to explain the form of motion, whatever that means. And you want to explain changes in the form of motion, which he called bifurcations. So he has to ask himself, well, well Ari, what, a, what is a form of motion? And he invents the subject called topology in order to answer that question, what is a form of motion? Because what he wants to say with respect to the orbit of the Earth, for example, is that every closed orbit is the same as any other. It doesn't really matter if there's a tiny little perturbation here or there. As long as it's a closed orbit, we're cool. However, all closed orbits are different from all spiralings in, because topologically a closed orbit is different from an infinite line. So now we can define a form of motion as a topological class of trajectories. The way that he does this is by creating, instead of talking about differential equations, and this is something that we're now te using to teach. The minute you see differential equations, you think equations, I'm going to divide both sides by this, I'm going to substitute this for that, I'm going to uh, put this in there. No. A differential equation is a recipe for setting up a vector field. And a vector field is an assignment of change arrows to every point in state space. So at the point x0, y0, we have the change arrow f of x0, g of x0, or g of x0, y0, or x prime, y prime, is the change arrow at x, y. Immediately, you get a sense of the movement of everything. You get a sense of how the dynamics has to be. The solution curve which can be proved to exist, then takes from a different, from a given initial condition, it's everywhere tangent to these change arrows given by the vector field. And in a famous paper on the curves defined by a differential equation, he's taking geometry and calculus and putting them together. That's a very powerful step. I'm going to skip the math here. The idea is, here is the vector field set up by a differential equation, and here is the trajectory from the given initial condition that is everywhere tangent to the change arrows. So you think of the system as, pardon the Californianism, as surfing the change arrows everywhere. And that is the resulting trajectory, and this is the motion of the system. So the powerful thing here is he has really redefined, in a lot of ways, how we look at math. The old way, and this is my big battle with the calculus classes in the math department, the 19th century view was math is language. And you bang on the language with methods, and you produce other pieces of language. And the 20th century conception is a geometric conception, which is a lot more powerful and enables you to do a lot of things. So what is a bifurcation? A bifurcation is a change in the topological type of the solution as some parameter passes a critical point. Classic engineering example, column buckling. We have a force for low values of the force 
there is a single equilibrium point at this al along the center line, but as that force gets past a critical point, the column buckles, this equilibrium point previously stable is now unstable, and there are two new stable equilibria, buckled left and buckled right. So this is a simple qualitative change. Um, it's called a pitchfork bifurcation. And I have to put that picture there because a lot of my students are not Native Americans and they don't know what a pitchfork is. Um, but in the pitchfork bifurcation, you see the, as the parameter in this case decreases, you see the emergence of two new stable equilibria and the change of the stable into unstable. And that's an example, an elementary example of a bifurcation. Um, lots of examples of this in physiology. Um, here's a high equilibrium of MAP kinase and PKC, and here's a low equilibrium. There's an unstable equilibrium between them, and this system acts as a biological switch. That is to say, it stays here until you cross the threshold, and then it snaps to the new equilibrium. So biological switches are bifurcations. But I can't talk more about that because I want to talk about the bifurcation I'm going to be using today, which is the bifurcation that is the birth of an oscillation. What we're really interested in here is what causes oscillations. And Poincaré had an answer. So the first thing is we have to define what is an oscillation? An oscillation is a closed orbit in state space. That yellow loop is an oscillation because it's a closed orbit. Here you see an example of the birth of an oscillation as this parameter changes through zero. Stable equilibrium point becomes an unstable equilibrium point with a new stable limit cycle. A new stable oscillation is born. And now the question is, is the equilibrium point stable or unstable? Now, the engineers here know this language, stability of equilibria, and you're thinking eigenvalues, and you're right. Um, how do we determine the stability of an equilibrium point? You form the Jacobian matrix, you find the eigenvalues, by classical methods, and then you have a theorem, first proved by Poincaré, which is that if you have a pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues, and as you're changing this parameter, that pair moves to the right and goes from negative real part to positive real part, then exactly an oscillation is born. So this was called poincare andronov hopf bifurcation, but it got shortened to Hopf bifurcation, although the French and the Russians don't like that. But it's called now Hopf bifurcation for better or worse. So a very simple example of Hopf bifurcation can be seen in the control of a heating air conditioning system by a thermostat. This is a very simple negative feedback system. We make a model, differential equation model of the system. The thermostat turns on the heat and activates the heat, the heat decays. The thermostat is sensitive to the heat, and it's sensitive to the heat in a decreasing sigmoid here, and so that the higher the heat, the thermostat turns off. And we have two parameters in this equation. We have an n, we have a tau. So n governs the steepness of the feedback function. Uh, low n, very shallow. High n, very steep. And tau is a time delay. It's the time delay that it takes for the heater to actually activate the thermostat. So the theorem applied to this situation says 
that the heater thermostat system will achieve equilibrium only if N is small and tau is small. But if you introduce a very sensitive, steeply sloped relationship, and you have time delays in your system, then you are going to get an oscillatory response, as the heater will make it very hot, but the time delay means the thermostat doesn't kick in. Finally, the thermostat kicks in, and it kicks in big time because it's very sensitive, so it brings the temperature way down, but then it doesn't actually activate the heating system, and so you're going to get oscillation. And you can actually make a bifurcation diagram that says you get oscillation only when the product of the slope and the time delay is above a certain value. So this is a powerful criterion because it enables us to explain oscillation. If you ask me, why did the oscillation occur? For example, in the Tacoma, Narrow, Tacoma Narrows bridge disaster, why did the bridge start oscillating? The answer in that case was an increase in the sensitivity of a certain feedback function and the presence of time delays set the thing into oscillation. This is now how we're going to explain oscillations. Incidentally, the Nobel Prize in Physiology last year was, uh, people think that what these guys did is they, dis well the news article said they discovered the genes for the circadian rhythm. Uh, no they didn't, the genes for the circadian rhythm were known for 20 years. What they did, which was much more interesting, was they showed that those two genes, period and timeless, produce proteins, and those proteins come back and inhibit the transcription of period and timeless. So those two genes produce a product that inhibits their own transcription. That's negative feedback, and then these, there are time delays in this system, and they are totally aware of this, and they say oscillations are achieved by delaying various steps in this negative feedback loop. And negative feedback loop with time delays is going to give you oscillations, in this case, the circadian rhythm. OK, enough of this. Let's talk cardiology. So I want to talk about EADs. And the first question is, what are EADs? Well, they're right there. What is your problem? Um, I want to ask, how do we describe them? Because if you look in the literature, and I'm, so first of all, for those people here who are not familiar with EADs, uh, they're found in lots and lots of situations. They're found close to MI. They're found in the case of oxidative stress. They're found in hypokalemia. Uh, EADs are a very common pathology and a source of serious, in fact, lethal arrhythmias. Uh, there's even, we have a, this is EADs in a hole, in a rabbit hole heart preparation uh, with optical dyes. And what you see here is synchronized islands of EADs coming and going and forming and dissolving. And this is producing a mostly focal, but to some degree also reentrant arrhythmia, and is of course lethal. So the question is, what causes EADs? I mean, here I may be stepping on the toes of some people here. I'm sorry. Um, you look at the literature, and you see a lot of answers. Inward currents are greater than outward currents. That's the cause of EADs. Uh, there's a decreased repolarization reserve. There's a reactivation of ICA. There's increased uh, calcium, calcium channel conductivity. You see lots of things like this. And my point is, none of these is even a candidate for an explanation of the ADs because all of these answers explain a rise in the voltage. 
But EADs are not a rise in the voltage. They're an oscillation in the voltage. None of these candidates explains an oscillation. So these are, from my point of view, non-starters. It's like this. Two people are arm wrestling, and you observe this phenomenon. And I ask you, what is the cause of that phenomenon? And you say, oh, that's caused by the fact that B is stronger than A. So that's silly. But that's what those explanations are actually saying. They're saying that oscillations are caused because the up force is greater than the down force. So to me, pardon my philosophy, but that, that's not even a candidate for an answer. Actually, if you think about what would explain that oscillation, you immediately realize that you have to begin to put in here time-dependent factors, like fatigue. It creates fatigue to be the top hand. And so the top hand fatigues, and then the bottom hand dominates, but then it fatigues. You have to build in time-dependent factors, and the time-dependent factors have to be in exactly the right time frames to create an oscillation. So let's take this to the cardiac cell. Don't need to introduce this model to this audience. Uh, but in fact, we are just going to use little over e one, which is a wonderful model to study stuff in when you don't need a gigantic amount of biophysical detail. A lot of dynamics can be explained already here, and in particular, EAD dynamics. So we have our usual dvdt equals sigma i. Um, and now we want to ask, what creates this out of this? So we take the Lua Rudy model. I'm going to go back a second. I should point out that one of the things we immediately do is we throw out INA, <laughs> because INA is long over by the time the oscillations of the plateau potential are occurring. And we focus on the calcium current. So the calcium current, as many of you know, in the classic formulation, has an activation gate and an inactivation gate. And the activation gate and the inactivation gate have differential equations. And the differential equations have a certain form. So this is a sort of a quasi-linear, not linear, but quasi-linear in the sense that this is an equation for d is trying to get to d infinity with a time constant of tau d. Here, f is trying to get to f infinity with a time, delay, a time constant of tau f. So we have here, and if you ask what do F in, this F infinity and D infinity, these steady state in activation and inactivation gates look like. Everybody here knows this is what the activation gate looks like. This is what the inactivation looks like. But the interesting thing is I want to call your attention to the slope of those curves because that's, that's going to be very important. The slope of that curve is the sensitivity of activation and inactivation to changes in voltage. So we take the lower root model, we delete INA, we take the standard formulation of the calcium channel and of the potassium channel, and we give ourselves little parameters here, alpha, beta, gamma, to extend, to increase tau d, tau f, and tau x, because these are the three time constants of this model, and remember slopes and time delays. So we know that there is an equilibrium at the plateau potential because we can actually stabilize that equilibrium with giant calcium current and a nice, a decently slow potassium channel, although it doesn't have to be very slow. If the calcium current is large, you are going to get repolarization failure 
which is what he says to a cardiologist, but to the mathematician what this is, is a stable equilibrium point at the plateau potential, and a terrible thing, too, that it's stable. So that proves that there is an equilibrium point there, and then the question is just, is that stable or unstable, and what is going to happen to it? So as I just said, the stability of equilibrium is determined by the Jacobian criterion and the Hopf bifurcation theorem, and we actually can capture the beauty of the simplicity of the LR1 model with just calcium and potassium is it's a three variable model and we can actually calculate the Jacobian, we can actually find the eigenvalues, and when we plug everything into the big eigenvalue criterion, this is what you get. That you will get oscillations, that is EADs, if and only if, this plus this is less than zero. Now you might say, that's a pretty ugly expression. And it is a pretty ugly expression. But you will notice what's in here. Time constant, time constant, time constant, time constant. A, B, and C are the slopes of the dependency of the current on the voltage. SD and SF are the slopes of the activation and inactivation curves. And there's this big old expression involving these quantities, which if it is, if it, it is less than zero, you will get oscillations. And the important thing is, this is the whole story. If you want oscillations in this model, you had better satisfy this criterion. You can't oscillate except through this criteria. So you have to ask now how do different manipulations of these tau's and these slopes, uh, how does that create the conditions for the oscillation? And the answer is you need to lower the slopes and or decrease the time delays, the time constants of the equilibration to F infinity and D infinity. So we set out to test this experimentally with, you had Dave Christini here I know, so you probably all know about dynamic clamp. Dynamic clamp is very cool. Dynamic clamp, you take a real myocyte, you take the current, you feed it into a real-time computer with real-time operating system, or you program an assembly language, and you type in your favorite formulation of some current. The computer calculates what that current would be for the present voltage and puts it back into the myocyte in microseconds. And that is so fast that the myocyte thinks it has acquired a new channel or a channel with new properties. So this is a very powerful experimental test for the effects of different currents or the effects of different manipulations of currents. So we are able to type in different activation and inactivation curves. It's really just typing. And what we find is pretty dramatic. Here's the black activation curve as the normal. Um, we shift it five millivolts to the left, which steepens the slope at that crossing point there. And that's the other side of the hot bifurcation criterion. And the difference between these two activation curves is the difference between the normal action potential and EADs. And you certainly would not have said, oh, that difference, oh, that's going to produce EADs. But the mathematical criterion says it does, and it does in fact. Same thing with the inactivation curve. A tiny shift from the purple to the black, five milliseconds, abolishes EADs or creates them. So here's a point I want to make. Let me go back to this for a second. This is all very mathematical. 
we're creating the new activation, we're changing the time constant of the equilibration to the uh, steady state value by typing in a new formulation. You're not going to do that in real physiology. In real physiology, you have to talk to this guy. You have to talk to the channel. And this is, of course, your up simulation of Cajun 7.1. Um, this is where drugs act. And if you now actually want to design a compound that will do what our typing did, you have to talk to this. And so I am certainly not saying don't think about this. Sooner or later, you've got to think about this. But then the next question is, OK, I can now change inactivation or activation. I know from Yoram and his graduate students' work uh, how to change this and that to change these properties of the channel. But what the global modeling tells you is how these properties have to be changed. In what manner? Would you need to increase this or you need to decrease that? But then when you want to do that, you have to act on this. Take a deep breath. We're now off the impulse. Want to talk a little bit about fibrillation. So fibrillation is clearly a qualitative change <laughs> in the behavior of the system from a periodic normal sinus rhythm to a mess. But when we first started, oh, and let me show you our little simulation here because I can't resist it. Uh, here is our whole heart simulation. We see a normal, we follow the bouncing ball. We see a normal sinus beat, repolarizes. We see a second normal sinus beat, repolarizes. Now we're going to get an ectopic beat. Coming. Now there's your bad PVC. And your bad PVC is then going to create reentry. That reentry is going to become unstable. It is going to break up into multiple wavelets meandering chaotically and is going to produce the electrographic signature of fibrillation. Um, this is actually a calculated ECG from that model. Uh, so we want to understand what is happening in this situation. What, what creates fibrillation? So we go back to the elementary medical school lecture, and we have all kinds of reentry. We know about reentry in an anatomic pathway, wolf buckets and wide, and you know the tachycardia, sure, sure. We know about re-entry around scar tissue, sure, sure. Uh, but Alessi, working in the atrium in the 1980s, identified a third kind of re-entry, which is the most important one, which is what he called functional re-entry. But we can think of as open field re-entry. No obstacle, no scar, no anatomic pathway. Just a re-entrant wave in open tissue with no anatomic obstacles. Interesting, there was Weiner and Rosenbluth in Mexico City in 1946 made a theoretical prediction of what a reentrant wave would have to look like. And they theoretically predicted it would have to take the form of a spiral wave. Uh, here it's around an anatomic obstacle. In the 70s, the Russian school said the same thing about open field reentry or functional reentry, that it would take the form of a spiral wave. So this is like an amazing theoretical prediction. There's absolutely no verification of this. No technology that would enable you to verify this. But now there is. Here's a spiral wave in the neonatal rat myocyte culture. Um, here's a spiral wave in a whole heart um, under a calcium channel blocking drug, which I'll get to in a minute. 
but there is a whole heart supporting, and this is all voltage sensitive dye, of course. Um, here is a whole heart supporting a very simple spiral wave. But what is fibrillation? What I've just showed you is not fibrillation. What is fibrillation? Fibrillation, well, if you go to Brown Walls, this is a scandal, I'm sorry, I have to say this. If, if, if you go to Brown Walls Heart Disease, the Bible, he has like eight pages on AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and he has one sentence on ventricular fibrillation, the big killer in our field. And what does he have to say about the big killer in our field? It's recognized by the presence of irregular undulations of varying contour and amplitude. Okay, that's terrible. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, that's a literary description. And if a literary description of your phenomenon is all you can come up with, then this is all you can do about it. And I, I call this the American approach because it says, I don't need to understand this. I just need to blow it away. <laughs> and that is the mentality behind the defibrillator. And so we, we have to be able to do better than this. Obviously, the defibrillator is not a destination therapy. It costs 50, 60 grand parts of labor. You have to pre-identify the at-risk population, which is very difficult. So it would probably pay us to try and get a better understanding of what fibrillation is than Brown Wolf is providing. So in the advent of mapping systems in the 70s, we were able to actually, not we, <laughs> people were actually able to look at fibrillation in tissue and try to map it. <coughs> And what they saw was that fibrillation, here's a 30 by 30 electro grid from Peng Chen. Um, what they saw was multiple wavelets continually becoming extinguished and also continually being born through the process of wave break, where a wave breaks into two and generates new daughter waves. So the next question is, what causes wave break? And the first answer cardiologists will give you is external factors, uh, ischemic regions, necrotic regions, uh, fibrotic regions. It's like the wave at the beach hitting a rock and having to divide. But dynamicists had come up with another concept which is this concept of purely dynamical breakup, where there are no pre-existing anatomical heterogeneities. The system manufactures its own heterogeneity. Here's a 600 by 600. Luo Rudy 1, here's an S1 wave going from left to right. It's going to repolarize. Now we're going to put an ectopic S2 it's going to create a spiral wave. And that spiral wave, due to its own instability, due to physical instabilities in the wave conduction, is going to break up into a multi-wavelet state modeling fibrillation. So now the question becomes, what makes the wave break up? So as we all know, if you give an S1 and then an S2, you're going to get another action potential duration. But we also know that if you encroach upon the diastolic interval by a shorter, by a premature S2, the red action potential is going to be shorter than the white one. And if you encroach even further, the blue is going to be even shorter still. And the green action potential caused by a very premature stimulus is actually so stunted that it cannot depolarize the surrounding cells. And this will not conduct, and you will get wave break at that point. So what we just showed was, if we pace this at a long 
cycle loads. We get a periodic train of action potentials, but if you pace at a shorter cycle length, you're going to get a long action potential, but now you're going to have a short diastolic and you're going to have a short action potential. But that's going to give you a long diastolic interval, diastolic interval here, so you're going to have a long action potential. And what this demonstrates is that fixed interval pacing plus the property of restitution, which is the shortening of the action potential with fast pacing, is itself enough to produce an alternating rhythm. And if that relationship, the slope of that relationship is steep, then the alternation is going to be marked. And if the alternation is marked, you're going to have very short action potential durations. And those very short action potential durations are going to create wave break. I'm going to skip this. Here is our simulation conclusion. Um, by making alterations to several different things, to calcium channels, to potassium channels, the, the detailed biophysical mechanism is less important than what did you do to the curve. So here are two steeply sloped restitution curves. And whether the action potential duration is long, as in B, or short, as in C, you still get fair So the bottom line here is not class three, yes or no. It's not have you lengthened the action potential or have you shortened the action potential. What you, the key thing here is the slope of that relationship. Here the slope is steep at short diastolic intervals. In both of these cases, the slope is shallow. You could think of this as a K-channel blocker that just increased all action potential duration. But if the slope is flat, whether the APD is long or short, you get a single reentrant spiral wave, and it does not break up into fibrillation. So we then we set out to model this in the whole heart. We use the partial differential equation for cardiac conduction. We need the diffusion tensor. We get the diffusion tensor from the diffusion tensor MRI. That goes into the model. And this is what we were able to show. Here is fibrillation in the native model, the baseline model. And then we just blocked ICA, the l type calcium channel. Um, don't do this clinically, but the result of it on the heart itself is to stabilize and spiral wave and prevent breakup. So we thought, well, that's interesting. That's a proof of concept, at least. And then T.J. Wu, who was a fellow of Ping Cheng, who is now the head of cardiology at National Taiwan Hospital, uh, did a stunning experiment where he took a rabbit heart, voltage-sensitive dye. Um, he S1, S2, a rapid pacing immediately induces fibrillation. You see here the waves are coming from the left. Now they're not. <laughs> now there's a little bit of, of rotor motion there. Uh, this is fibrillation. This is incidentally a perfused Langendorf, so this can go on for a long time. And we found a drug, which is basically a fast-acting calcium channel blocker, B600 which lowers the slope of this curve in a dose-dependent manner. And when we give a nice dose to that preparation, it turns into the intact spiral. So the bottom line is the bifurcation from stable spiral wave to spiral wave breakup is produced by the critical parameter of the slope of that APD response curve, that if you blunt the slope of the APD response curve, you can prevent the breakup into fibrillation. And that this is uh, kind of a template 
for how a drug would have to act. And the interesting thing, of course, is that there are many different biophysical mechanisms for altering the slope of that curve. <coughs> and that's when you want to, or you can't say to the biochemist, give me a drug that lowers the slope of the restitution curve. I mean, they would have no idea what we're talking about. You have to talk about a drug that addresses a channel and the properties of the channel. But what you need to do to that channel, biophysically, is lower the slope of that curve. My last point is, we have actually been using this qualitative dynamics, nonlinear differential equations. We have created a freshman class for our biology students teaching these ideas in lieu of freshman calculus and the intermediate value theorem and rule theorem and integration by parts and substitution of variables and a lot of other worthless techniques <laughs> from the calculus of one variable. Um, and the students love it and it has been very successful. So I think that this whole new perspective is, is, a, is a game changer in terms of how we think about drug actions and research. It's also something that we should be teaching to our students. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for telling us everything about the Feynman diagrams of the heart. <laughs> and um, those who have questions or comments. Please. I, I really enjoyed this. It was a great talk. Uh, you didn't really talk much about alternands. Uh, it's been very easy to see the modification of your alternand. One of the things that's fascinating me is when you really can create Spatially discordant alternates. I had to drop those slides. Oh, <laughs> we have a paper. Give me your card. I'll send you the paper. Okay. The, the the transition from spatially concordant alternates to spatially discordant alternates is a bifurcation in the partial differential equation, and it is brought about by conduction velocity. And once you bring conduction velocity into it, our paper shows the bifurcation that makes concordant alternates turn into discordant alternates. And yes, by God, you're absolutely right. Concordant alternates is not a huge problem, and discordant alternates, spatially discordant alternates, is a huge problem. There are many papers that, that came on this uh, from David Rosenbaum's so. Yes. And for example, David Rosenbaum was able to show experimentally that there is a quantity, we were just talking about this this afternoon with some of your students, there is a quantity DAPD DX, the spatial gradient of refractoriness. Right. And if DAPD DX is greater than a certain number, you're in trouble you will get reentrant fibrillation. And the nice thing about that, if you ask a cardiologist, or well, everyone talks about dispersion of refractoriness. And you ask a cardiologist, well, what do you mean dispersion of refractoriness? Very often you'll get the answer, the standard deviation of the APDs, or of the QT intervals. The standard deviation of the QT intervals, mixing up stuff from the base and stuff from the apex, is has no biophysical meaning whatsoever. The key quantity, as David correctly demonstrated, is not the standard deviation, it's DAPDDX, because when that is steep, a wave originating in the short APD it's going to propagate very nicely until it hits the long APD region where it is going to block. And that's a beautiful mechanistic explanation. We're able to absolutely verify that mathematically, but the insight was different. Thank you.
Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you, if you take some of these more detailed models, do you, do you see any approach for applying such a beautiful approach for understanding their dynamics? Like, once we go through and simplify all the equations, can you take out a detail and then put the, the rest of the model as a very coarse equation? You have to begin to do stuff like that. And that means things like dimension reduction techniques. And I am a huge believer in dimension reduction techniques. Another way to put, take a high dimensional model and turn it into a low dimensional model, that's a description of what you would call science. And, and the, what it would be very interesting to do is take one of your own big models and use like things like manifold. But PCA is, of course, a linear dimension reduction technique. But there are also nonlinear dimension, manifold reduction, and stuff like that. It's a very fancy math. And it would be very interesting to take those high dimensional models and understand their low dimensional dynamics. Because basically speaking, high dimensional models with lots of parameters give you biophysical detail if you can verify the parameters. Whereas low dimensional models give you understanding of the dynamics, although typically you can't do anything <laughs> with that understanding of the dynamics until you can translate that low dimensional model back into the high dimensional. There's another important factor in all of this, which is the single cell model, right? But in, in real life, the cells are always in the tissue and in the whole heart. And they're electrically loaded. And that has a huge effect that blunts a lot of these responses. So this very high sensitivity and uh, steep slopes, and all of those things are blunted by the fact that it says are loaded in the tissue. Absolutely. And so well, that's another Absolutely. thing to consider because when you have myocardial infarction or other conditions that uncouple cells because of redu reduced gap junction conducting, Differences then all of, a sudden, all of a sudden these things start to, exactly. to appear. And exactly. We have a slogan in my lab. That's why yep. homogenizing scars is doing what it's doing. It's not because it's all of a sudden repaired. Oh, that's interesting. The tissue, but that's interesting. You know, it takes away the effect of the surface resurfacing of those of those differences. Non-linear yep. linearities in the cell. Yeah, we have a slogan in my lab. <coughs> uh, the cell is swell, but the issue is tissue. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think. That that's speaking to that point. Any other questions over there in the dark? Anybody in the dark? I think. All right, well, thanks again. Thank you.